beauty of the icy. morning. This is the day the Lord has given us. Rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to your father's house. It's so good to see everybody here today and welcome to the people online. Pray with me, please. O oh Lord, Father of your son, Jesus Christ, we come to the house of the Lord today to refresh our souls, to praise you, to glorify you and all of your majesty. It may have been a hard week for some of us, and we need to recharge our batteries for the next weeks and days ahead. Thank you for all you do for us. You give us what we need. You teach us life lessons so we can remain faithful to you. Help us turn a blind eye toward any temptations that would disappoint you. May our hearts be on you always. We ask these things in your holy name, amen. There are lots of announcements on the back of your bulletin. I'm gonna hit some highlights. I wanna remind you of Trivia Night next Friday. It's coming up quickly, so if you haven't reserved or bought your tickets or whatever, uh, you need to go ahead and do that. Um, that's the 18th, June the 18th. We're raising funds uh, to build a women's dormitory in our uh, adopted orphanage of Kenya. So important. Uh, there is a Pray For Me seminar um, on June the 22nd, 10 a.m. Tony Souter will be here uh, to present the seminar, and it's an emphasis on praying for our grandchildren. So if you have grandchildren, uh, this will be something very important, something you'll want to uh, participate in. It's 10 a.m. on Tuesday the 22nd. On the June 27th, we are having a potluck luncheon. Uh, bring a dish, uh, desserts. If you can make homemade ice cream, bring that, show that off. Um, oh, fried chicken is gonna be furnished. Don't have to worry about that. Um, and all of this is following the patriotic service, which is going to be held at the 8.30 a.m. as well as the 11th. Um, so that will take care of most of the things. I do want to remind you about the uh, 100th birthday and the Burn the Mortgage program. Please pray about that. Keep that on your heart. Uh, the deacons have uh, made some more uh, bas uh, uh, bags, tote bags. Uh, the the uh, HHP tote bags with non-perishable items to take to people in need, people that you know might could use some food. Thanks. Good morning. It's wonderful to see you all here today. You know that we're blessed, right? Um, I had the, the blessing and opportunity uh, to go for the second week in a row, go camping with uh, my family. I got burnt like a tomato. Anyway, I'll wear sunscreen next time. But um, all the blessings that we are offered and that we're given to God on a daily basis, you know, we take for granted. Um, and I just, it's just, uh, it keeps me speechless, the things that we forget about. So to help sit there and glorify God this morning, please stand with us and we're going to sing blessed be your name.
to worship this morning is taken from Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. You are my God, and I will give you thanks. Let's stay standing and we'll join together in singing how deep the Father's love for us.
I wonder what would happen if I didn't say you may be seated. <laughs> you may be seated. <laughs> so good to be obedient, isn't it? We're going to do a missionary moment. I think you saw this video last week. We want to show it again. Sometimes the language, well, it is difficult to understand exactly what our, this teacher at Mercy Mission is saying. But first of all, she thanks you. And then she shares the need for mattresses and blankets and beds, and the scene that you see is essentially the place where about half the 40 girls stay at night. There's two bunk beds and floor mats and so forth, and that's a classroom during the day. So where this video is, is a classroom, one of the five classrooms at the school, and then the girls stay also in a second classroom. So the need is huge. There's girls who need protection, they need safety, they need just the blessing of a place to sleep and stay safe from things that affect and attack them. The blessing that we have in this trivia night on Friday night too is we have three donors and out of those three don or we'll match the funds. Um, your dollars donated now to trivia will be matched up to three times as much. So up to $5,000, if we raise $5,000 on Friday night, 15000 $500 will be directed towards that mis mission to build that dorm, and that's really close to what we need. So here's your video, and we thank you for your support. For the good work and all the provisions that we have provided for these small kids, it have been a blessing to them, and that's why they're looking the way they're looking. As you heard from them, they don't have a, a dormitory. This is where they normally sleep. They use this room at the same time during the day as a class. They don't have beds, mattresses, and they don't have enough blankets. So it is a prayer that as you pray together with us, our kids can at least get a better dormitory, enough beds, enough blankets, and also enough mattresses. May God bless you. I see you partner with us. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, one of the things you see too is the general health of the girls there, and that's because they have food. So thank you. Uh, we have a moment, a testimony moment right now. Uh, Rob McCleary wants to share with you a testimony of what God's doing in his family. And we think it's important for you to hear what God is doing among your members, among the church, so that you too will give him glory and you will share the testimonies of what he's doing in your life as well. Rob. Good morning, everyone. Something happened about six, seven hours ago that I never thought would have happened as long as I lived. I wanted to share it with you. It's a story of encouragement. Uh, encourage to pray, to trust God, listen, and, uh, and be obedient. So the story is our, we, we have two daughters, both live in Sweden, both do not follow the Lord uh, until about six hours ago. Uh, our, uh, my wife, Jenny, is over there helping our oldest daughter uh, with a baby she just had. So she's been there almost uh, three months. And we, we talk occasionally and, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting off track here. Here's what happened. They went to church today at a church just right down the street and, and uh, Jenny sent me a text. She says, uh, you already know how good God is but let me tell you just how great 
and great is in capital words, or capital letters. Sorry. So I went to a church today, just a short walk away. Uh, short, wait, wait, uh, Kim, which is our oldest daughter, offered to go with me so we could just spend some time together. It was a contemporary evangelical church that has all sermons in English in the middle of Sweden, right down the street. Okay, it gets better. All right, so, so great, right? Here's the best. Afterwards, Kim said she actually could see herself and her family, which is our two grand, uh, grandsons uh, and, and her husband, uh, her family attending there, and she wants to go next Sunday, uh, which will be down uh, a, a special service near the water. Uh, all of us plan to go. Kim met a few women her age, and all have young children. Uh, so I'm sorry. Uh, the sermon today was so truly relevant. Uh, God was there and talking to Kim. Uh, you can see it online at C. Three, it's like the, the capital C, number three, Malmo. Uh, just thought you uh, would like to hear this before heading to church. Amen. Amen. This chapter, thank you. So just when weak and unbelieving, no, not unbelieving, but a, a week of faith, a person thought, I, this day will never happen. I'll ne you know, they will never be in a church. Rob, just kind of keep praying, but don't get your hopes up. Well, God had different plans. So I encourage you, well, we're all dealing with something. Please don't give up. Please keep praying. God, in his own time, will find a way. And I thought, isn't it interesting, and I also encourage you, those with children or grandchildren, the seminar that's going to teach us more about how to pray Tuesday. Is that right, Barb? Oh, I thought it was this Tuesday. Okay, a week from Tuesday. Okay, well, I got another week to prepare. But anyway, so I certainly encourage you to go there. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, oh, dear God, yes, we don't know how, but you do. Give us the strength through the Holy Spirit to hear, to listen, to trust and obey. And we put all our hopes in you, Lord. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rob, for sharing that with us. Pray with me, please. Father, as the sun rises in the morning, you are always faithful. As the darkness comes every evening, you are faithful. If we can only be that faithful to you, you bless us all day and all night. We need to repay your love with thanksgiving, prayer, glorifying you always. Great is your faithfulness. Now we take a few moments in silent prayer to confess our sins and ask for your forgiveness. Lord, we pray for those who need prayer, which is all of us, but special prayers for those suffering illnesses those suffering lifelong illnesses, those recovering from procedures, those caring for these patients as well. Give them all the strength they need to recover fully. We pray for those still grieving for the loss of loved ones and friends, and family members. We pray, pray for our country. It's kind of a mess. People have turned away from you and ignore your part in the creation of this country based on your love and fairness and wisdom. Open the eyes of the leaders. Be with and strengthen the leaders of our military. Protect our constitution and our God-given rights. Be with our first responders, firemen, police, EMT. They need your protection. 
Now, Father, we join in saying the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. 
Please stand with me and let's recite what we believe in the Apostles' Creed written long, long ago. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the one holy and universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Let's continue our worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings. in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. Sometimes I feel discouraged and think my work's in vain. But then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again, revives my soul again. There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. If you cannot preach like Peter, you cannot pray like Paul. You can tell the love of Jesus and said he died for all. Yes, he died for all. There is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul, to heal the sin-sick soul. Pray with me, please. Most gracious Father, please accept these tithes and offerings to the King of kings and the Lord of lords to further your kingdom on earth. May they be used to show our love for you and honor you as our Father in heaven. Amen. Let's join together singing, I love you, Lord. be seated. See, she's nice. She tells you to be seated. <laughs> we 
Councilman Ellenberg. Okay. Well, it's good to be here with you. Our scriptures today we'll look at as we go along through the course of the message as this is God's story and we try to bring it to you as God's love story, describing who he is and how we respond to him. If I ask you the question, how can I help you? How do you respond to that? I think we respond to that question depending on our attitude and our needs, don't we? We walk into a store and we need something right away and we don't know where that item is. It may be a new store or someplace we've been before, but we need to know. We need to know right now because I know what I want and I need to use it and take it home and use it. So if a clerk comes up as you walk into the store and say, how can I help you? You're just really delighted to hear that question, aren't you? <laughs> and sometimes we go someplace and, oh man, if I only had some help to find what I need. And, and so that's a good thing. Somebody says, how can I help you? But what if you walk into the store and you just want to browse around and you just want to be left alone and check things out on your own, figure out if there's something here you really want or not, and somebody comes up to you and says, how can I help you? And you just want to say, well, you can leave me alone. <laughs> or, you can, or you just say, well, you know, I don't need any help right now, thank you, and go on your way. And the scriptures that we look at today are, are about, as Barb indicated, about Elijah and Peter, two men who were anointed to do such incredible, powerful work of God, who came to crisis points in their lives when they needed to go to God and say, I need your help, Lord, but they didn't know how to do that. They didn't know if they were worthy of doing that. They didn't know if God was interested in them being with him any longer. Fear, that F-E-A-R word, is so encumbering on us in so many ways. We've experienced it in so many ways this past year, and there's cultures around the world who experience fear for so many reasons. It can just slam down on us and cause us to feel we're separated from God, can't it? Like God just has gone away from us or we're away and we don't know what to do because we're so afraid. And so that can, that is that one element that can really create a crisis in our relationship with God. And so we need to come to a point in understanding even in a fear, God wants you to come to him to say, I need your help, Lord, and you need to know that God is there to say, can I help you? So we begin with Elijah. Elijah is probably a man you know less of than Peter. His, his work and ministry is found primarily in 1 Kings 17, 18, and 19, and then later on in Eom show up again to do some remarkable, powerful work. Elijah was a, a Tishbite, it says. And what's that mean? He came from a village called Tish in a, in a region of Nephtali, which is one of the uh, tribes of Israel. And he came from east of the Jordan. Just think if he's east of the Jordan and he comes over to the west and he comes into Samaria, which is a capital city of northern uh, or of Israel, the northern kingdom. And right there in Samaria was this evil King Ahab. The Bible says it was one of the worst idolatrous and evil kings in Israel's history. Not only that, Ahab was married to Jezebel. And we all know that word Jezebel means evil, don't we? And, and so this woman was an evil queen to an evil king. And God sends Elijah, this regular kind of guy, to do prophetic work amid this evil. And before we get to our scripture, we need to know what Elijah did because we, we see how he spoke this remarkable power of God into Israel in a great time of need. For example, as 1 Kings 17 begins, Elijah spoke a drought into Israel where there would be no dew nor rain. Spoke God's word and the heavens changed. And when you speak God's word into a place where there's an evil king, the evil king wants to destroy you. And we learn later this Ahab hated Elijah. And so God sent Elijah into the desert to protect Elijah's life. And there God fed Elijah with the ravens and he gave him water from the brook. 
And God had this amazing care over his prophet, and Elijah experienced that day by day, God's presence. And then the brook dried up, and so God sent Elijah to Zarephath. Zarephath was where Jezebel had come from, and Zarephath was where God would use Elijah to do some more remarkable work. God pointed Elijah to a widow. He said, go to that widow and, and speak to her the power of God. And Elijah went to her. She was on her last meal. She and her son had one more meal, she told Elijah. We'll eat it and then we'll die. And Elijah said, feed that one meal to me and you will have bread and oil as long as you ha have need. And that's exactly what she did. This woman in a pagan country believed God's word. God spoke through Elijah the power of expanding the food. We see later on that this widow's son died after God had given life to this household. Then what happened? Well, God spoke through Elijah. Elijah spoke the power of God into this boy, and the boy resurrected from the dead. Wow. And then we see Elijah return to Israel, and he goes and has this contest on Mount Carmel, and there's 450 prophets of Baal out there, and, and then there's one prophet of God, Elijah. And they see who's, who God is real, and the prophets of Baal spend all morning calling on Baal and all day, and Elijah just mocks him and mocks him. And no fire comes down on the altar of Baal. Elijah douses his altar with water and floods it, and then he calls on God, the fire to come down, and boom, it's all burned up in the power of God. And then Elijah spoke to the Israel people, said, destroy those prophets, destroy these evildoers. And 450 Baal prophets died that day because Elijah spoke the power of God's judgment. And then Elijah prayed for rain to end the drought. And the rains came, nearly washed them away. So what's Elijah doing here, speaking to change the heavens. He spoke to, to enlarge the food, the bread, the daily bread. He spoke to resurrect a boy. He spoke the judgment of God upon God's idolatrous pagan priest. What was he doing? Demonstrating what? The power of God. Who would come again some 750 years later to demonstrate the power of God on earth in a like way? Who was it? Jesus. Elijah was Jesus-like. Elijah was like the Son of God in Israel. Wow. He spoke and things changed. Wow. The power of God through this man, this prophet, but then we come to the crisis. When Ahab runs home and tells his wife Jezebel what Elijah had done in killing the prophets, now we look at 1 Kings 19, beginning verse 3, and we'll go through verse 14. And it says, when Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you have killed them. Elijah was afraid. And he fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. This is as far, as far away as you can get in among God's people as you can. Southern part of Judah, from northern Israel, the southern part of Judah. He fled this fearsome Jezebel. Why? How does this man who has so powerfully spoken the word of God, so powerfully anointed by God, doing life work, Feeding, saving, resurrecting, judging, bringing rain. How does this man suddenly become so afraid? What happened that he would turn from his relationship with God to staring in the eyes of the evil Jezebel? 
Well, that Jezebel again had the reputation. There's another prophet, Obadiah, who was, had spent the last few years hiding 100 of God's prophets from this woman to keep her from killing them. Elijah knew she was a killer. And the scripture talks about other ways that she destroyed people for her own sake and her own desires. But Elijah stared at the evil, he took his eyes off God. Perhaps he was just being practical. I'm getting out of town because the evil Jezebel is after me, and there's nothing I can do to stop the power of the throne of Israel from coming against me. Think about it. He was afraid of the power of the throne of Israel when the throne of God had been on his side all those years. It's difficult to understand how we can suddenly change, but that's what can happen to us. We all experience that in some way, don't we? When the crisis comes, we wonder where to go and we wonder who to look at. Take our eyes off God, look to the enemy, and we become fearful and separated from the presence of God, don't we? And it goes on in 1 Kings 19.4, And when he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day, he sat down under a solitary broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. He wanted to be done with life. And then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. And then, an angel, and then an angel of the Lord touched him and said, Get up and eat. And he looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals. This is no box lunch. <laughs> this is a great meal before him. And a jar of water. He ate and drank, and then he lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God, way south, back where Moses had met with God on his way out of Egypt. Mount Sinai is another name for Mount Horeb. There, he went into a cave, and he spent the night, and the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. And the Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. Then there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after that came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, excuse me, and when Elijah heard it, he pulled out his, clo his cloak over his face, and he went out and he stood at the entrance to the cave. And then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord, God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. He calls the Lord the Lord God Almighty. That's creator, Yahweh, Almighty God, and yet he has rejected the presence and the power of the Lord God. His heart is not where his voice is. How do you react to God's question? 
his interaction with Elijah. Are you wondering if God knows what are you doing here, Elijah? Well, certainly the all-knowing, omniscient God knew why Elijah had come to him. It seems that God had been directing him to him. He sent the angel to care for him, to feed him, to water him, just put him on a journey, not to stay where he was, but to put him on a journey to the mountain that God had led his prophet to that place to talk with him, to have his prophet come to be in his presence. The Lord God Almighty asked the question because he is a wonderful counselor. Counselor is a word that describes God throughout Scripture. The prophet Isaiah said that, that uh, pro proclaiming the coming of uh, the Christ, the Messiah, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And Jesus said at the end of his ministry, preparing to go to the cross, he said to his disciples, don't worry. You will not be alone. I will send to you a counselor to help you say what you need to say and to do what you need to do in the power of God to proclaim the presence of God on the earth. Throughout Scripture, God is defined as a helper. He is my help and strength. He is my ever-present help in my time of need. Help is a powerful word of God's strength. He was formed to be a, count, a helper to God, to Adam, to be his, the his strength, to be a completion of the creation. God is our help, and he wants to know how he can help you. So there on Mount Horeb, or Mount Sinai, God met, where God gave the law to Moses, God encouraged Moses, God had this relationship with Moses, to direct his help into the prom to the people of promise, to direct them to the promised land under the laws and the covenant of God. God brought his prophet Elijah to counsel him, to strengthen him. The wonderful counselor questioned, what are you doing here, Elijah, to say, how can I help you? How can I be of strength to you? Of course, God knew Elijah had retreated at the height of victory. Elijah had prayed that he might die, that he wanted to end his life. Elijah blamed all of Israel for his problems, and he expressed self-pity as he says, I am the only one left when he knew better. Go on to read, God will say, there's a lot more <laughs> in Israel for you, but we won't go there right now. But it was time for Elijah to say, I am here, Lord, because I need your help. I need the Lord God Almighty to be in your presence. I need to be with you. I need to feel your strength. I need to be confident. I need to get rid of this fear that has taken me from you. It's true, isn't it? When we try to hide our fears, the hiding effort wears down our body, our mind, our soul, our strength our well-being can even take away from us physically. It can cause illness and destruction physically in our lives. There's a song by Matthew West that always impacts me. It's called Truth Be Told. It speaks to this. Some of the lyrics include lie number one, you're supposed to be, you're supposed to have it all together. And when they ask how you're doing, just smile and tell them, never better. Lie number two, everybody's life is perfect except yours, so keep your messes and your wounds and your stresses safe with you behind closed doors. Truth be told, the truth is never told. I say I'm fine, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine, hey, I'm fine, but I'm not. I'm broken. And when it's out of control, I say it's under control when it's not. And you know it. I don't know why it's so hard to admit it. But being honest is the only way to fix it. Can I really stand here unashamed, knowing that you love me, that your love for me, Lord, won't change? Can I really stand here, huh? Unashamed, knowing your love for me won't change. That's what God wants you to know. 
Oh God, if they're really, if it's really true, then let the truth be so told. I'm say I'm fine, but I'm not. I'm broken. Living God wants you to know as one created in his image, there's no better place on this, earth, on this earth to be than in his presence. Knowing God, you know you are laid bare before the holy God, whether you want to be or not. He knows all of who you are from eternity past to eternity future. And that's why people stay away from the church. That's why unbelievers say, I don't believe in God. Because they are deadly afraid that God knows who they are. They don't want God to look at them. They want God to overlook them. And I think so often that's our case too, when we want to hide our fears and our failures. God wants to even come to those who deny him. That's the gospel, my friends. The gospel is that the God who knows me loves me. Even, yes, if we might deny him. And we go to our scripture, John 21. And we know the story that Peter has denied the Lord Jesus Christ and wept in his shame, confused in his guilt, fearful of losing his relationship with Jesus, no longer being present with the Holy God, one he had been very, very intimate with, one who had seen the glory of God come in the transfiguration of Jesus Christ, where Elijah came, <laughs> and Peter had even seen Elijah in the transfiguration. Yet the fear grabbed hold of him when a servant girl said, you're one of them, aren't you? Just as Elijah ran from Jezebel, Peter ran from the servant girl, ran in fear. And then Jesus comes, and then when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep, I feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, well, then take care of my sheep. And then the third time, Jesus said to Simon, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him this three times, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Well, then Jesus said, feed my sheep. Why did Jesus ask the question? He did know Simon loved him. He wanted Simon to confess his love, didn't he? He wanted Simon to fill his heart with the love of Christ and put his fears away forever to go minister the gospel of resurrection power to the world. And just as Peter had denied, I don't know the man, and Elijah had run and said, I'm running in fear, Jesus and Elijah had run, or excuse me, Peter and Elijah had run, God also brought them to him. God went to the mountain, said, Elijah, come on up here. Jesus went to Galilee's shore and says, Peter, come here. I want to care for you. I want to help you. My friends, God is a wonderful counselor. There is a tenderness in his judgment when he speaks to correct us. God's purpose is to turn our hearts to fully trust him, to empty the fear away in the, and fill it with the presence of God in our lives. He wants us to say, I'm not fine, truth be told. I need your help, Lord. The wonderful counselor 
loved his fearful prophet and his fearful apostle. He asked them the question, why are you here? And do you love me? And then he listened to them. He listened and he heard. And Warren Wiersbe, the commentator, says, God's word comes down like the gentle shower that refreshes, cleanses, and produces life. End of quote. And then Jesus, well, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, gave to each the work to do in the counselor's power. Elijah would go on to do more miracles, and one day God took him to heaven in the chariots of fire. Peter and Elijah would go on to become the most important, one of those main bridges between the Old and the New Testament. He's spoken of as the end of the Old Testament. He's spoken of in the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. John the Baptist comes in the power of Elijah and does the work that he is prepared to do in Elijah's life-giving power to begin the kingdom of God on earth as, a, as a God prepares Israel for Jesus' appearance. Jesus says John was the Elijah to come. And then, of course, Peter becomes a bridge from Jesus' teaching to do the power of resurrection and the power of salvation into the church. These men who are afraid become fearless for their Lord God Almighty because they are in the presence of God. And this is for us too. God wants us to know he can help us when he says, how can I help you? You can say to him, I need your help, Lord, and this is how. He knows what you need, and he knows how good it is for you to be with him. Let's pray. Father, I praise you and thank you for the promises in your word. I pray that we would take hold of your word with all our hearts and minds, that you would give us joy in meditating on it day and night. Cause us to be quick to obey all that you command, knowing your promises of goodness will follow. Create in us courageous and strong resolve to pursue all that you desire for our lives. Don't let fear cause us to falter. Fill us with faith to believe we can go anywhere you command. Cause the power of your presence to strengthen us, to pursue you, your purposes with courage, for your glory and good in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and we'll join in singing more love to thee.
the God of peace and the God of joy who counsels us to his wisdom and truth fill you with knowledge and comfort and peace. Rejoice that he is welcoming you into his presence. Amen.